This episode of Harvey Brownstone Interviews is brought to you by the Harvey Brownstone Talk Show Blend Coffee, available at hollywoodblends.com. Everyone's saying it's the best coffee they've ever tasted. Why not give it a try and see for yourself? Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today we're celebrating the music of one of America's greatest and most iconic songwriters, Harriet Schock. She's written many hit songs, including Hollywood Town, First Time on a Ferris Wheel, You Are, Rosebud, Worn Around the Edges, It Tears at Me, and of course, the multi-platinum selling, Grammy-nominated Ain't No Way to Treat a Lady, recorded by Helen Reddy. Most recently, Harriet wrote and recorded the poignant and emotionally powerful coming out anthem, I Am Yours, which I'm very proud to say was inspired by my story and my struggle to gain parental acceptance after telling my parents that I was gay when I was 19. Harriet is here making her third appearance on our show to discuss her highly anticipated magnificent new album entitled Paintings. And she will be singing the title track from the album during this interview. The album has been released to coincide with an upcoming new documentary film about her entitled Hollywood Town, The Harriet Shock Story. And joining Harriet making his second appearance on our show is a highly popular singer songwriter whose heartfelt recording of I Am Yours, which he performed the last time he was on our show, led to the making of a beautiful new album of some of Harriet Shock's most beloved and enduring songs entitled Present Shock the songs of Harriet Shock. One of the hit songs from this album is a newly reimagined rendition of Ain't No Way to Treat a Lady, sung from the male perspective. And Gary will be performing the song for us on today's show. I'm delighted to welcome back to our show the brilliant and mega talented Harriet Shock and Gary Lynn Floyd. Harriet and Gary, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Glad to be with you again, thank you. First of all, congratulations to each of you on your new albums. I absolutely love them both. Harriet, are you excited that for the first time there are two new albums being released of your music? It's just crazy. I can't even believe it. And I'm so happy that Gary is here with us. And really, it was your idea that created the whole thing. You suggested it when he was on the show. And instead of going, what? I wouldn't even consider it. He said, oh, yeah, let's do it. I was pretty sure he would. I mean, who wouldn't? I want to start by talking about Gary's new album because the genesis for that album did happen right here on our show. That's correct, right, Gary? That is correct. Yes, you and you and Harriet had reached out to me to sing the vocal for I Am Yours, and which I was so honored to do and connected so much with the song. And then, yeah, and then we just had a brainstorm and created a whole album together. Harriet, what was your reaction when you learned that Gary decided to make an album of his favorite Harriet Shock songs? I was just, well, I've always been a fan of Gary's. And so when I heard that not only was he doing I Am Yours, but all these other songs of mine, I was on Tinder hooks to find out which songs he chose. And he told me, and I don't know if you realize he has such an incredible ear. He just listen to my records and then just play them. <laughs> yeah. Gary, as you know, Harriet has a huge catalog of songs. How did you go about choosing the songs for the album? I, well, a lot of songs I knew because I, I knew Harriet when I lived in Venice Beach and I sang background vocals for her. We spent a lot of time together. So I was familiar with a lot of the songs and then I just went through her catalog and listened through and found new songs. There was a, a new song that I had found called Quietest Part of the Day, which was one of the first songs that I chose, which I just fell in love with. And yeah, so I, I was very familiar with a lot of Harriet stuff and it was just, it was such an honor to be able to go through and pick my favorite ones. The Quietest Part of the Day was co-written with Steve Wagner, a wonderful songwriter. I just want to credit him. It's a fabulous song. It's the first track on the album. Harriet, were you involved in any way in Gary's choice of songs for the album? No, I just sat there and waited. And then when he told me, I thought, wow, he doesn't even know some of those songs. So I think he must have gone to Spotify and just listened to everything. I went and listened. And then Harriet was involved in that I would 
I would play, I would uh, record a demo on my phone and send it to her just to make sure that I was in the ballpark. And she would catch, you know, lyrics or a chord here or there that I had, you know, I was doing the best I could through, through my ear. But she, you know, she helped me through the process of just fine tuning them. Harriet, what does it feel like when you hear another singer performing your songs? Well, it's been the entire spectrum. I've had some singers who do what they consider their rendition, but in fact, it is not exactly the song. So that bothers me a bit because I, I choose the notes and the words on purpose. But in the case of Gary, it was like my wildest dreams of how it could be done by man. And that was fulfilled. You know, it was fantastic, but it's not always that way. I'm not saying I don't appreciate every cover of everything I've ever had, but sometimes you're surprised. Well, that was going to be my next question, Harriet. Were there any surprises for you when you first heard Gary's album? Not in not in the way I'm talking about. It was only surprising in that I could appreciate the songs from an exterior viewpoint. You know, hearing a man sing my songs, a lot of songwriters think you have to demo the song with a man because if a male singer hears a woman singing, they'll think it's a woman's song, which is really not true. Women can write songs that are from a man's viewpoint, as you know. But hearing a man sing my songs was really wonderful for me. I appreciated them on a, another level. Well, Gary has the perfect voice to convey emotionality. You can convey joy. You can convey hurt. You can convey healing. That's just part of your vocal delivery, Gary. So I, you know, when I suggested that you should do an album of Harriet's songs, I was sure you would react the way you did because her songs really resonate with the timber of your voice. Does that make sense? Totally, totally. I think that's why it was such a great collaboration because her songs have all of those elements that you just described. I appreciate you saying that about my voice, but just the healing and the depth of of the writing and yeah, you know, a, a woman wrote the songs, but I think they're universal and they could be sung by anyone because they're, they're just such a universal message in them. Well, Harriet, I'm very intrigued by the male version of Ain't No Way to Treat a Lady. Tell us why you wrote those lyrics. Well, it had been a hit. You know, I recorded it, then Helen Reddy heard it on the radio. She recorded it and had a hit. And I was very grateful for that. But I thought, you know, what every woman wants to hear is a man apologizing for doing that. So some years ago, really maybe 20, I wrote the male version fr from the viewpoint of a man talking to his woman about having treated her badly and apologizing. And I gave it to my publishers and they liked it, but, you know, nothing ever happened with it. But I demoed it with Gary. Now, I thought it was a country thing, so he sang it real country. But he can only do that because he's such a versatile singer. He's not really a country artist in my viewpoint. So when he recorded it this time, he did it just like a man singing to a woman. And it was really lovely. Yeah, I must say that I had the honor of being in the audience at Birdland last June when Gary played and saying, ain't no way to treat a lady in front of a packed house that included everybody from Michael Feinstein to Billy Stritch. And all through the audience, you could hear people saying, that's a hit. That song's a hit. <laughs> Harriet Sharp's going to get another hit out of that song. So we're all in now for a treat because Gary has agreed to perform the new male version of Ain't No Way to Treat a Lady, which is on his new album, Present Shock, The Songs of Harriet Shock. Take it away, Gary. You said it was 
was myself I was involved with And then you started to cry I guess I never found a way To hear what you were saying Till you told me goodbye That ain't no way to treat a lady No way to treat my baby my woman, my friend That ain't no way to treat a lady No way But maybe it's a way for us to end You were busy being With all the colors you know Well I was busy looking Into white blue mirrors And loving the show That ain't no way to treat a lady No way to treat my baby My woman, my friend That ain't no way to treat a lady, no way But maybe it's a way for us to end There's a funny kind of consolation keeping me sane And I'd really like to share it while it's fresh in my brain I see the times I never felt you Loving me or needing me But losing you now I finally know how to feel the pain You were looking out for my happiness While I was looking within before I knew my own reflection always starts to tire me, it had happened again. That ain't no way to treat a lady, no way to treat my baby, my woman, my friend. That ain't no way. Maybe it's a way for us to end Wow, Gary, I loved it. You know, I got to see you perform that song twice, once at Birdland and also at the Stonewall Inn for the official launch of Pride Month, where you performed the song in my honor. What goes through your mind when you sing that song? Recording the song took me back to an earlier time in my life. I was in college. I'm a gay man and I was not out of the closet, was just trying to figure out my life. And I was raised in Southern Baptist Church in Texas. So I had all that indoctrination of believing that possibly if I got married, God could work it out. You know, I, I still was in that frame of mind. So I was engaged in college and I graduated the year before she did and kind of began to find myself and realize that I was on a different path and needed to end the, end the engagement. And it took me back to that moment of the apology, like Harriet said, the, you know, going through that thing of, of saying, you know what, I, I wasn't figured out for myself at all about who I was and what, I, you know, what I needed to be doing with my life, but I knew that it didn't include that. And before I hurt more people or her anymore, I really needed to pull myself out. So it took me to that moment of apologizing to her for the way that I, you know, for my consciousness, I guess, in not really knowing who, you know, who I was and how that all was going to figure out. But I've had, you know, guys come up to me 20 years later 
who said, I admired what you did because I got married and I, you know, have two kids and I just came out. And so there, I thought I was crazy, but I realized, you know, years later that people kind of admired that move and it was the best move for me and for her. So that's where it took my mind when I recorded it. You know, as you were telling that story, I'm thinking, Harriet, there's another song there. <laughs> what is it, Barbie? <laughs> well, I come from a generation, I'm older than Gary, but I come from a generation of gay men. In fact, every gay man I know of my age did marry a woman, did try to play the game so they could fit in and be part of the mainstream society. I'm the only one I know from my generation who, are, and well, Gary is younger than me, who had the guts to say, no, I know what I am. I know that wouldn't be fair. I'm not gonna do it. But for all those men out there who didn't have, for whatever reason, didn't have the fortitude to withstand standing out, you know, there was a price to pay and there's, there's a song there. Well, I see what you mean. Yeah. yeah. There's a song there. I'll let it marinate okay. while I ask you, you know, both you and Gary have featured two of your new songs on both of your albums, I Am Yours and Because You Lived. I want to start with I Am Yours. Although the song expresses my personal plea to my parents to accept me, even though I disappointed them by turning out gay, I've had dozens of people tell me that the song resonates with anyone who has been longing for parental love and acceptance. How did you manage to make the lyrics so universally relatable? Well, I should say that I interviewed you before I wrote this song and I have 15 pages of notes. So the song could have gone a lot of different ways, but you and I discussed the bond between a parent and a child is what you wanted to focus on. So that's what I focused on. And considering all of the ways we want parental approval, it could have anything to do with career choice, you know, fashion. It could be almost anything that you did that disappointed your parents. But then when you got back together, they loved you. you they loved you all along and you belong to them and you reinforce that. Well, I just think that every time someone tells me, someone who's not gay, who didn't have an experience like mine, tells me how that song really penetrates their heart and their soul because of some experience they had with their parents, it reminds me what a genius you are. And I, I want to tell our viewers that you can see Harriet Shock performing I Am Yours on our show by going to the video you see on your screen now on our YouTube channel or website. And you can see Gary Lynn Floyd's performance of I Am Yours by going to his first interview on our show, which is showing on your screen now. Gary, you've been performing I Am Yours in your concerts all over the country. How have audiences been reacting to the song? they have the same reaction that you described there are people who whether people are are gay and have had a coming out story i think that a lot of people have coming out stories and are not particularly gay but they have things that they've had to reveal things they've had to deal with in their lives and i just i'm so honored to have been able to sing the song because when i went into the studio to record it i couldn't get through it the first time because i had that same experience with my parents that you had and, and I felt such a healing being able to sing the song. My parents have both passed, but I just, I felt them in those moments and just that healing of, of that relationship. I had a few moments with them before they passed, but audiences love the song and yeah, they're, they're very moved by it. And I just feel really lucky to be able to share it with people. Harriet, what's the feedback you've been getting when you perform I Am Yours in your shows? Well, I think people respond to it. I mean, I have a an audience that is my target audience, but I'm not sure how I would describe them. They're all ages and all colors and all religions. But if someone is marrying someone their parents don't like, they relate to that song. 
If they went into the arts and their parents wanted them to go into business, there are so many examples of people who come up to me and say, you know, I am my parents' child in spite of what they considered that I did, you know. And the good thing is in your song, you get back together with them. I think that's healing in itself for people who may not have had that opportunity. But the point that I appreciated you making is that we got together because I had achieved something so important that they didn't have to be ashamed of me anymore. And the oh. lyrics, when I finally made it to the top, you finally softened. You know, that refers to me becoming a judge. When I was appointed a judge by the government, which is a lifetime appointment here in Canada, that was so prestigious. They were so impressed that I could have made it that far that they revisited their feeling of being ashamed of me or embarrassed by me. And you captured that in one line, one lyric. You made the point. It, it took that for them to really not be embarrassed anymore. And like I say, you're just a genius. Well, thank you. But I think, you know, a lot of people are in the arts and they may not be a big star. They didn't go into business, but eventually their parents see them in concert and they hear their records and they realize in many cases that the child has done what they always dreamed of and were afraid it was too hard. It was trying to protect the child. But in fact, they are now living the parent's dream. So well put. Now, Harriet, when you were last on our show with Jim Keaton, we talked about Because You Lived, which you wrote in honor of Jim's 50-year friendship with Helen Reddy. How different is the process for you writing lyrics that tell someone else's story versus when you write lyrics telling your own story? Well, I, you know, I've written songs for film and at one point I wrote a song for a Motown film where the young man was an African American male virgin studying Kung Fu who fell in love for the first time. So I thought, well, what do I have in common with him? Well, I've fallen in love for the first time. So I wrote what we have in common. Now in your song, I could relate to all of that. So I wrote it, yes, from your viewpoint, but I'm human, so I share all of these feelings. And certainly with Jim Keaton's song, I had a relationship with Helen Reddy too. So all of the love he felt, I put into the song because I felt it too. I want to tell our viewers that you can see Harriet Shock performing Because You Lived by going to her last interview on our show when she appeared with Jim Keaton, which you can now see on your screen. Now, Harriet, your new album, Paintings, contains a really beautiful and fascinating collection of new songs. You deal with a whole slew of topics, including online shopping, in a song called Brick and Mortar, and there's a song for your husband called Any Other Man, and a song about your father's marimba, and a very nostalgic song about your memories of your childhood called Mine Now. How do you come up with the ideas for a new song? Well, you have to realize it's been many years since my last album. So I just went through all the songs and chose the ones that I felt most strongly. But my now is a really interesting story. I read a book recently by Quincy Jones on creativity. And he said, there's this point when you're almost asleep and you're very creative. And he has his entire team almost sleeping and getting ideas. So. I hadn't read that yet, but when I was starting to take a nap, the entire chorus almost came to me. I saw a lake and the sun on the lake and a, a stone skipping across it. And that's how I got those lines. And I thought, why am I thinking of this? And so gradually I realized since Tom was making this movie about me, I couldn't really remember a lot about my childhood, and that's what that song is about, what I did remember. Gary, you're a songwriter as well. Does that resonate with you, that you can sometimes come up with a melody when you're almost asleep? Oh, yeah. 
when all the brain is kind of shutting down a little bit and uh, you, all the clutter begins to go away. Yeah, definitely those are some ripe moments for hearing melodies, getting ideas for lyrics. You know, that's so fascinating. When we had Paul Williams on the show and Melissa Manchester on the show, both of whom brilliant songwriters like you, Harriet, they said something similar. It's mm -hmm. fascinating. Really, really fascinating. Well, folks, we're in for another treat. Harriet has agreed to perform the title track from the new album called Paintings. Harriet, before we hear this song, can you set it up for us? Well, I, my husband and I had gone to see the movie about Vincent van Gogh called Eternity's Gate. And I saw him struggling, you know, and painting these beautiful paintings that no one knew about. And they were up on his wall. And I thought, God, just selling one of those, he could live for, you know, but no one knew who he was. So it wasn't that valuable. And his brother helped him. And then I realized 10 years later, he became, you know, Vincent van Gogh and everybody was, you know, doing and eyeing about him. And I thought, this is the plight of many artists. You know, no one knows who they are. <laughs> and a lot of times they can die and 10 years later, no one knows who they are still. But in van Gogh's case, he just couldn't hold on long enough for anyone to know who he was. And that just so moved me. I had to write this. Okay, everybody, please sit back, relax, and enjoy this very special performance by Harriet Shock with Andrea Ross Green singing backup vocals, Paintings. How soft he could be If he'd sell one of those paintings Yet he loves each one of twelve up on his wall So his family comes through Like they always do It seems all that he has to do is call Their only paintings It's just art He has so many You'd think he'd part with one of them or maybe none of them would bring enough to pay his bills And surely no one wants to buy the whole shebang So there they hang The yellows are so bright It's like they're bleeding sunshine and he wonders if the world might see it too So he moves with such speed Once his mind is freed If life's a puzzle, color is the clue They're only paintings It's just art He has so many You'd think he'd part with one of them Or maybe none of them would bring enough to pay his bills And surely no one wants to buy the whole shebang So there they hang He wishes they would sell with every breath If only he can last until one decade past his death That's when the paintings on his wall Became the paintings in hallowed halls and galleries And through eternity we all see the sunlight too the future learned by heart the song he sang And here they hang What an emotionally impactful song. I absolutely loved it. And I want to point out that the wonderful Andrea Ross Green, who sang backup vocals, is also a very, very dear friend of Harriet and mine. So thank you very much to Andrea as well. 
Now, Harriet, I know the song is called Paintings, but in a way, could the lyrics also be about songs that have gone unheard by the public or books or poems that never got published? Well, yeah, I think it could be about any art that is just not known by the general public and not appreciated because it's not known. A lot of art, if it is known, it is appreciated, but getting known is very difficult, especially today when everyone is out there and the, the pile is just so big. How do you rise to the top enough to get known? But yes, every artist goes through this. What made you decide to title the album Paintings and to make this song the title track? Well, the name of the song is Paintings because it, it, it is a metaphor for all art, but you know, people go, oh, it's only art. You know, it's only paintings. That's why I said that. And then I wanted to call the album that because my songs have a lot of visuals in them. And a lot of people have said they're like paintings. So I call the album paintings. Beautiful. When you're writing a song, Harriet, what comes first, the music or the lyrics? Well, because I teach songwriting, I discovered that even though I used to start with the melodies, it's important to know what you're going to say when you start. So now I usually just sit down and start writing a little bit and then I flesh it out, but I have to know where I'm going because you know, you get in the car and you just start driving, you could end up anywhere. So I, when I wrote Ain't No Way to Treat a Lady, I was on a plane and I, I wrote the first few lines. I guess it was yourself you were involved with. I would have sworn it was me. I got the whole first verse and the first line of the chorus. That ain't no way to treat a lady. Then I came home and I started writing it at the piano. So I realized if I did that before and it worked so well, why don't I start with a lyric? And I never did that until recently. And it does help to start by talking, you know, before you start putting music to it. What about you, Gary? What comes first, the music or the lyrics? Most of the time, the music comes first, but I recently decided to take Harriet's workshop again. I would taken it years ago and I've written, I'm kind of like Van Gogh in that I got 40 years worth of songs that no one knows. <laughs> so I, 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 identify with that plight and I love that song paintings but I'm in in taking Harriet's workshop I am seeing the value of coming up with a lyric and going through the process with Harriet has really been a great way to continue learning as a songwriter and so I'm really grateful that I decided to take the the class again and then for Harriet's she's such a masterful songwriter but then she also is such a great mentor and teacher for people who would like to write songs from people who are beginning writing and then for people like me that have been writing songs for 40 years just to get motivated again and kind of nudged in a different direction has been really cool so i'm in the process of a song right now and it's all lyrics and it's real re bizarre for me because i can't even hear a melody yet and i normally hear the melody first so it's kind of nice sometimes to get outside your own box and and do things differently. <laughs> but I, I want to say one thing here. You don't write the whole lyric before you get to melody. Oh, no, 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 no. There's a lot of steps in the process. <laughs> I'm on the I'm on one particular step with Harriet where I was only supposed to write a verse and a chorus, but I got so excited that it was flowing as it was flowing. I just like, I, I came on the, on the class last night. And said, I finished, I wrote all the lyric. She said, slow down, <laughs> just can, you know, just do it by the process. And it is a, it's an incredible process. Thank okay. You. I'm going to go outside my box now. Have the two of you ever considered writing a song together? Oh, we have a song together. We do. Well, when we are we all going to hear it? <laughs> it's on one of your albums, isn't it, Gary? It is on one of my albums. It's called Beat of My Heart. We wrote it with my friend Annika Paris. And we've also had a conversation recently about writing another song together. So I think that's yeah. probably in the mix at some point. I have Beat of My Heart. I have that album. I just didn't realize that it was written by both of you. So yes, please write more together. 
You know, I have to tell you, Harriet, that even when your songs are directed to a specific person, like your husband or your students or a very special fan in Austria, I feel like you're speaking directly to me, especially in the song, I Knew You Before. Do you get, I mean, really deep down inside, do you truly get how unique your gift is to be able to make your songs resonate so universally? Well, I hope they're universal. And I'm so happy to hear you say that because, you know, Bina Wiesenbeck is my dear friend from Austria. And she she found me online in a Jane Seymour movie singing a song. She tracked me down. We've been in touch she was 17 she's like 34 now we've been in touch ever since by email and she's come to visit me twice and she's coming in january for my birthday so i decided i had to write a song for her and i'm so happy you feel that that song could be for you because it really could because i feel like i knew you before too and you and i have never met which is insane but yeah i like the universality but you can't plan to have something be universal. I believe that the more specific, the more universal. And so I wrote specifically for her. And so you also relate to it. It's just a fascinating thing when I listen to your uh, music. There's a line in your song at the bridge that says, there's really no fodder like a broken heart. That line permeates through many of your songs. Is songwriting therapeutic for you? Oh, of course. Sometimes I wouldn't know what to do in a situation. And I thought I better write a song because the song will tell me. There, my songs, and I think everyone's songs, are prescient in that you really know what you need to do, but you won't do it. But if you write a song, the art won't let you get off the hook. You know, So that's how I do it. But you know, that song at the bridge is also about my husband because it's like my love like life is shaped like a song. There's a verse, a chorus, a verse, a chorus. And then I met my husband at the bridge, which usually comes after the second chorus. And so later in my life, I met him and it was still 20 years ago, but it was later at the time. <laughs> wow. Gary, when you write a song, is there a therapeutic aspect to that for you as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, a lot of a lot of the songs I've written through my life, I wrote a song because I was having difficulty getting the words out. And so I, I used music for a long time to communicate things that I needed to communicate either with my parents or friends or, or relationships <laughs> that I couldn't necessarily speak out. You know, I couldn't get it out of my mouth any other way than just to write a song. So it's, songwriting has definitely been my therapy for a long time. So Gary, when you write a song, do you write with your own voice in mind? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I I would say 90% of my songs are from my own perspective and my own voice, things that I've been through, experiences that I've had. Have you ever wanted to write for another voice? A song that you know, maybe a power ballad or something that you don't think you'd want to sing, but you could see someone else doing it, like, you know, Lady Gaga or something? Not yet. I don't think I have. And I, I admire that ability in Harriet to be able to give voice to other people's stories. And then all, as a singer, it was just so awesome for me to be able to give voice to your story and to Jim's story and to find myself through your stories, through Harriet's music was just a really great experience for me. Well, I've had more than a few people tell me that they've listened to I Am Yours sung by Harriet and then sung by Gary and they feel different things in both renditions, which I find fascinating because it's the same song, same lyrics, and yet they feel something different when a woman sings it versus a man. Does that make sense? I think it probably just means that that person relates more to a woman singing something or a man singing something, but I think it's more a, a function of the person who hears it then it is our voice is different. What do you think, Gary? I, I agree. And specifically, when, when we're talking about the universality of the lyric 
and how it can mean different things to different people. The line, would I have risen to the top without rejection? For you, you had risen to the top. For me, I've, I viewed that, that line as, oh, would I have been a big star? Would I have risen to the top if I had not been rejected? <laughs> was, a total, was different for me. So I think that's, it's an interesting, that's just a specific line, but I think that the beauty of a great lyric is that people can bring it into their own lives and it can mean, you know, what it needs to mean for them. Well, that particular lyric that you mentioned has been the subject of many conversations with people I know, because that question, would I have risen to the top without rejection, is really Harriet's way of acknowledging that you can become an overachiever, that parental rejection is a great motivator, because you're so determined to prove to them that you're worth loving, that you're worth being accepted, and they don't need to be ashamed of you. And so I noticed myself when I was in law school, I was much more ambitious than the other kids because I was so driven to prove to my parents that they didn't have to be ashamed. Without that rejection, I'm sure I would never have been so determined to be at the top of my class. And again, Harriet finds a way in one line to express the essence of what it is to be an overachiever. I don't know if that was conscious where you were thinking of all of that, Harriet, but that's what that line meant to me. Yeah, I think I remembered something you said in the interview about maybe I would never have done all this if they hadn't just kicked me out, you know. (laughs) And so that really resonated with me. I know a lot of people who want to show somebody in the business or they want to show their spouse or somebody who said that you will never make it. That is the motivating factor. (laughs) Very, very much so. And you know, Harriet, there's been an interesting evolution in your songwriting over the years. Many of the songs on your first few albums were about personal romantic relationships, but this latest album is much broader in scope. Do you find that the subject matter of your lyrics is getting more nostalgic, more philosophical, more insightful in terms of focusing on themes that really matter in life? I don't know that I had any kind of consciousness about that, but there are some romantic stories in this one as well, but I'm very happily married. (laughs) And, you know, I I have an article called Oysters and Muses, and what it's about is, you know, an oyster will spit until you it gets a pearl and a songwriter will have something that bothers them so much they have to write a song. Now, in my earlier years, I was still looking for, I think, my husband, but I was sure finding other people (laughs) instead. And so I would spit at that until a pearl came, and that was what made the songs. But my muse now is life itself, and I do think of my husband often, and, you know, it tears at me, and so many songs are about him. But in this album, I had other interests. I was worried I wouldn't remember enough to to be, you know, to do a movie about me. So I wrote my now and I I read I watched The Handmaid's Tale and was inspired to write Samantha Lynn. So there are a lot of inspirations in this album that are not just some relationship that didn't work that I had to tell him how bad he was. (laughs) I'm just kidding. But, you know. Well, I think we all have Mark to thank for the fact that you've been able to shift your focus now into things like online shopping and Amazon, which is one of the most clever songs, I think, in your entire repertoire. Now, Gary, you're a very highly accomplished and successful singer-songwriter yourself. You've mentioned that you've studied songwriting with Harriet Are you able to articulate what's the most important lesson you've learned from Harriet as a songwriter? Oh, wow. I think, I think one of the most important lessons is to get connected to your own voice and to get connected to what you, what you want to say and take your time, not be in a hurry, 
allow yourself to brainstorm and to get ideas before you feel like you have to put them into a lyric so that it becomes a lot more clearer and the the ideas and the message becomes clearer by taking the time to to sit with things and not be in such a rush to feel like you have to write it or even to you know for me even to have a melody that i feel like i have to fit the words into the melody before the words are even there and so i think i think the biggest thing i've learned is just to take time with it and to allow myself to process and to let it let it just kind of germinate before i before i think i need to finish the song <laughs> how does it feel to hear that harriet Oh, it's wonderful because he's already such a wonderful writer. You know, I'm like that photographer who they said, how do you have such gorgeous photographs of these vegetables? And he said, I just have people bring me tomatoes, tomatoes, no tomatoes, until I get the perfect tomato and I take a picture of it. So I have students who are already so good and then I take the credit for them, you know. But the steps I have in my course are different from the way most people write. And it does slow them down a bit and make everything clearer and the melody much stronger. So I, I've been doing it for over 30 years and I know it works, but to hear someone like Gary praise it is thrilling to me. But when a songwriter is writing a song for their own voice, for their range, with their vocals in mind, do you find that limiting as a teacher? No, because, you know, they should be able to sing it when they go out there and perform their songs. So that's fine. And there are plenty of singers who have the same range as my, my songwriting students. But it is nice to be able to write from another viewpoint or you won't be able to do songs for films. So in the process, I have people doing that, even if it's just a little exercise we do at night to get somebody thinking from another viewpoint. But remember, you're behind the camera, so you can't really see what someone else feels until you know how to write a song that makes sense from your viewpoint. So that's how we start. Well, now, as I mentioned in my introduction, there's a new movie coming out very soon from filmmaker Tom Solari about your life and career called Hollywood Town, The Harriet Shock Story. Are you able to tell us anything about the film? Well, I, I have 150 people coming to the premiere and I'm a little nervous because I think they might think it's some sort of biopic or something, but it's just, it's me in concert and talking about the songs, people in my early career being interviewed, my family is in it. And it's thrilling for me to hear what people I know so well had to say. For instance, my family, and my nieces, my sister, Roger Gordon, who really started my whole career and people like that. And so it isn't one of those movies where, you know, First of all, there are no car crashes and no motorcycles, but it is, it, if you like songwriting and you're interested in the process, I'm hoping that will be in there enough that you really are inspired by the movie. That is my main intention, is to raise the level of songwriting out there and I'm so fortunate someone came to my show and felt that other people should hear this. So that's why he made the movie, but it's different. It's not like, oh, it's about this woman who became a big star overnight and this is all the background because guess what? I'm not a big star and you're gonna be sitting there listening to somebody you never heard of in, that, in the case of people who don't know me. So I'm a little nervous about that, but we'll just have to see Harvey. Well, I think everybody needs to know who you are and to learn about your music. I'm so excited that there's finally going to be a documentary about you and your music. I can't wait to see the movie. Gary and I will both be there at the premiere. And congratulations, Harriet. This is very well deserved. It shines a light on your talent. And, you know, I think there are many definitions of big star. And to me, you are a big star. Oh, thank you, Harvey. Well, you're one to me, too. And Gary is as well. You know, 
Well, you know. Harriet and Gary, it's been such a pleasure having you back on our show. Congratulations to each of you on your new albums. I wish you the best of luck with them. Thank you both so much for taking the time to appear on our show. Thank you, Harvey. Thank you so much. Our guests have been multi-platinum selling Grammy-nominated singer-songwriter Harriet Schock and the brilliant award-winning singer-songwriter Gary Lynn Floyd. Harriet's new album, entitled Paintings, is available on ooyah.app. And Gary's new album, entitled Present Shock, The Songs of Harriet Shock, is available on Amazon, iTunes, and every major music streaming service. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to my producer, Steve Silver, my director of programming, Deborah Batsafin, my production assistant, Rosa Puzo, my PR directors, Eileen Shapiro and Jimmy Starr, and my entire team at the XPTV1 network in the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.